This is Duke University. Good evening, everybody. How are you? Uh, I know Anna Walker has done a great job in, in putting this event together. Uh, she was uh, she was calling around looking for me, and uh, I had messages coming in on my cell phone. Bill, where are you? Bill, where are you? I said, listen, I'm a just-in-time sort of guy. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, and uh, and someone said, well, you know, tell Anna uh, to you know bug her off. And I said, listen, of all people on earth, Anna Walker is the last person I would ever say anything bad to, anything but you know, but wonderful things to. She is uh, a real joy to work with. She's a, a fabulous uh, asset for the law school. And if you don't know Anna, you all should get to know her. But she is she's making a lot of things happen around here. So, uh, thank you very much, Anna. So. I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to this program. We're, we're uh, focused on entrepreneurship and innovation. This is something that uh, we've, we've uh, uh, been, been pushing at the law school now for two years. Uh, this is, we're in, into our second year of the law and, and entrepreneurship program. We're pleased that uh, Kit Fry, uh, who's sitting in the middle here, has uh, taken over the helm of that program. Uh, Kit comes to back to Duke uh, with, with many things to offer. Uh, at one point, I mean, this is a guy who went to USC film school, so he knows film. He uh, worked for Ted Turner, so he knows all about how, do, how, do you, uh, how you do deals with, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, just you know, swinging, uh, swinging uh, uh, your, your careful, weight around. Careful, careful. <laughs> <laughs> Swing, swinging your weight around. Um, I'm sure he could tell stories about Ted Turner that uh, that uh, would make everyone blush, but Ted Turner. Um, so, but uh, Kip has been phenomenal. He's uh, founded a number of companies. He was a partner at uh, InterSouth, which is the largest uh, venture capital firm in the region. Uh, after that, he went to uh, Zenf to uh, found a new company that, that focuses on sound reproduction. And from Zemp, he has become the CEO and president of uh, Evo Apps, which is a company focused on, on taking social media and mining social media for information that will help uh, large corporations and small corporations uh, understand their place in, in, the, in, in, uh, in uh, the marketing world and their place in the product and branding world. Um, we also would like to welcome Glenn Kaplan, who's joining us. Glenn is, Glenn is a partner at, uh, at uh, uh, the Chapel Hill office of uh, Robinson Bradshaw. Simultaneously, he's also one of the co-founders of Joystick Labs. These guys have, have uh, put together a company that, that uh, has funded and developed a number of gaming uh, uh, technologies. Uh, he has a number of games that are on the horizon. Uh, can I say the number? Sure. Yeah, yeah. We've got... Uh we funded seven companies, and we should have the first four games coming out of that in the next three months. So that's pretty, pretty fantastic. So, and then finally, we have one of our students, Ryan Blackman, who, is, who joins us from, from, with degrees from Campbell University as well as from uh, UNC Wilmington. Ryan has, has specialized in bankruptcy, finance, and corporate law. He's currently working on his LLM program, on the LLM in Law and Entrepreneurship. He is, uh, he's had experience in the U.S. Bankruptcy uh, Court of the Eastern District of North Carolina, the Small Business and Technology Development Center of North Carolina, U.S. Bankruptcy Court, and we're very happy to have him as a student with us. And I see he has some of his uh, student colleagues here tonight supporting him. So thank you guys for showing up. We're really excited to have this group here tonight, and we're really excited to have you here tonight, because without you, uh, this, this program uh, would not uh, be half of what it could be. And I, I really, really ask each one of you to think of ways in which you, your clients, your network can help us create a much better uh, learning experience for the students here at Duke than, uh, uh, than we are, are otherwise able to produce on our own. And we can only do this through you. Thank you so much. With that, I'll hand it over to Kip. Thank you. Um, I'm going to lean forward a little bit here. Uh, Ryan's classmates, are, so some of Ryan's classmates are here, and since they're all my students, um, I just want to mention that while some of them are here, some of them are not here, and their grade will be reflecting that fact. Um, 
uh, once we once we get more toward the end of the semester. Um, thank you for coming tonight. I, I think uh, I think what we might do is uh, I, I think I'll free associate just a little bit about the entrepreneurial community in general as it's developing here at Duke, and specifically as it's developing at the law school. Um, mostly in, in its embodiment in the LLM LE program, which unfortunately is the worst name for a program. It's so hard to say L L L M L E. It stands for LLM is the graduate law degree, which I don't even know what it means. Does anyone know what those words mean? Sorry. Master of law. Well, that's only that's M and L. What's the other L? I think it's in Latin. Though, so. yeah, it's okay, so, so this is, we're off to a bad start here. Okay. <laughs> it's what? so nice you had to say it twice. Okay. Um, but, but the program began uh, last year, and this is our second year. Um, we've got a great uh, class of students this year who, were, who we've been interacting with for a while. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about that, that and I'm going to get you guys involved here. Um, but in general, I will say that entrepreneurship uh, has become at Duke a, a very, very important focus, uh, not only here at the law school, but across the entire campus. And one that really has the, uh, the, the, the support and the enthusiastic um, participation of the entire administration all the way up to the president's office. And that's represented by recently the naming of Kimberly Jenkins as uh, the, the person in charge of entrepreneurship across the entire university. Um, here at the law school, uh, as, as I said, we've, we've, we've recognized this with the LLM LE program. And, and the program really is meant to provide one more year of academic and practical work for students who want to understand how this ecosystem, how this culture of entrepreneurship works specifically in the Research Triangle Park area, but more generally around the, the country and around the world. And it's meant to uh, have a couple of very key attribu attributes. One is it, it allows students to focus on uh, courses that Really, uh, really, really zero in on the entrepreneurial experience. Uh, students have a, 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 the, the ability to take courses both in, at Fuqua, at the business school, at the law school, and then maybe even more importantly, th in the second semester, the, uh, the the program allows the students to participate in what is called a practicum, which is a a very involved uh, unpaid internship at an entrepreneurial organization, and that organization could be a venture capital firm, it could be uh, a startup company, it could be a law firm that represents startup companies. There's a lot of flexibility in, um, in, in, in how the practicum is uh, executed and, and, and applied in, in the second semester of the year, and it's really, it's, it's, it's the, the large part of the second semester of the, of the program. And so what we're engaged in right now with the group of students is uh, lining up those practic. And the other thing about this is I never know what the plural of practicum is. Uh, I, I guess it's practica, but we tend to say practicums. Wh whatever, whatever the plural of, wh the students are doing those things, okay? And, um, and, and, and then in the spring, uh, in January, we'll start to, to watch and, and, and help them along in, in, in that journey through, uh, through the entire semester. So I thought what, what I would do is maybe involve you guys a little bit and talk specifically about the program some and then more generally about the, the, the community with Glenn. And, and, and maybe, Ryan, if I could start out by asking you, um, and re remembering always that I have to give you a grade in about a month and a half. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, what, 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 has been, what has been your experience, and how was it different from what you thought it might be when, when you started the program? Well, your class has definitely been the highlight of my time <laughs> here. I'm going to just start out by saying that. But um, this course and this program has been a lot more practical experience than law school, um, and it's definitely very focused on the startup enterprises. Um, we have one course, which is probably the only course that's like a traditional law school course, and it goes through the life cycle of a venture-backed company, and we start with from the formation to pretty much to the end till the exit. 
Um, but there's other programs that there's a program for entrepreneurship, which a lot of people are involved in over at Fuqua. And they actually work with some of the student companies here, some of the student startups, and actually are advising those companies. Uh, personally, I'm in a course called Invention to Application. And that's where they take five different faculty technologies from the technology transfer office. And I'm working in a group. And we take those and we narrow it down in the fall semester to one. And then in the spring, we move forward and try to commercialize that technology. And that's stuff that I never got in law school. I don't know very many law schools that are doing things like that. So it's very practical um, as far as working with companies and startups. And um, one of the reasons why this program, this LLM, LE program exists at Duke is that we happen to have at our doorstep and all around us one of the most significant and thriving entrepreneurial communities in the country and really in the world. And it just seemed like a natural place to take advantage of all of the activities that are that are going on in that community. And one of the participants in that community and one of the one of the active and central figures is Glenn. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about where you see the community right now. Uh, what are the strengths? What are, what are the weaknesses? And then we'll come back and maybe talk a little bit how Duke fits in with that. Sure. So um, just by way of background, I started my career after graduating from Duke Law by going out to Palo Alto and I worked at Wilson Sonsini, which is a big technology firm, and then moved back to this area in 2005. So I, I've been here about seven years and have a pretty good understanding of the ecosystem. And in, within the last 24 months or so, I, I feel like the community is really at an inflection point where, especially in Durham, there has been this really nice coalescence of startups and entrepreneurial people both uh, service providers uh, as well as investors and uh, just the community has really embraced it and has it's creating a pretty unique niche for North Carolina, right? This area has always been a very entrepreneurial area that starts interesting companies, you know, historically a lot of life science and biotechs and back in the 90s a lot of IT companies. Um, but we're really seeing, I think in Durham for the, well maybe, I don't have the full historical perspective, but um, I was at a panel today and they were talking about how if RTP was created back in the 60s to reflect America at the time, right, very commuter, car centric, we were spread out, very suburban, what's happening in downtown Durham is kind of what's coming next for America is this urbanization, people living and working in close proximity, not driving 25 miles to work every day. And so that's pretty exciting because there's a collective uh, sense of um, community success. So the startups that are there, and it's a lot like Silicon Valley, they really want to see other startups succeed because they know that will reinvest itself. Those, those entrepreneurs will reinvest in the community, uh, maybe provide seed financing to another startup, but also just providing support and credibility to the whole community. So it's pretty exciting right now. By the way, there are, I believe, on the order of 50 startup companies in downtown Durham right now. Uh, is that about right, Bill? Uh, yeah. Like a square mile. In, in, in about a square, a square couple of miles, okay, 50 of them. Um, there may be 30 tomorrow, but there are 50 today. So, um, Ryan, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Ryan, how are you? Um, how are you experiencing this community? What what kind of things are you doing to inject yourself into the community and 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 finding your way through it? Uh, well, there's a couple things. The last Two days I've actually spent at the Internet Summit, which was in downtown Raleigh. Um, there's a lot of events like that. There's a lot of events through Fuqua. They have a lot of entrepreneurial. There's the Entrepreneur and Venture Capital Club, and they have a lot of events and networking things and things that involve startup companies and students. Um, CED is probably one of the biggest ones around here, uh, the Council for Entrepreneurial Development, and they're constantly having tech events, life science events, and different things where you can go to and just meet with people, hear speakers, talk about the industry, and kind of just get to know and understand the community. Um, Glenn, I know you're involved in a lot of things at Duke. How are you seeing the Duke culture evolving or changing with respect to entrepreneurship? Yeah, I think it's changed a lot, both from an administrative perspective, but also the students themselves. I think, you know, five or six years ago, there were uh, one-off students who had an interest in starting their own company. And now I feel like there is a, you know, maybe it's just the times, but there are a very high percentage of undergrads that I come across who 
actively seek to engage with the community, are working on a startup or have an idea and want to connect with people in, the, uh, in Durham or in the Triangle generally. And the administration uh, has really embraced that. I think uh, historically there may have been a little bit of a tension, right? There's not tremendous incentive for the university to support entrepreneurship because those are students who are no longer seeking employment at McKenzie or IBM, and that hurts statistics. But those, you know, Mint.com was founded by a Duke alum. Um, you know, Taylor Mingos is a local success story, started this company called Shoebox, did his dorm room in Duke, and is now, I think, has 50 employees in downtown Durham and is doing really, really well. So uh, Jesse Lipson just sold ShareFile, started that, I think, as an undergrad at Duke. Um, so the, the Duke undergrads are, it's a pretty vibrant, I think, Tonight is the finals of the ele elevator pitch competition. There's just a lot of activity happening on the campus. And there's now, just given what's happening in downtown Durham, a lot of crossover between the community and the students. And that's making both stronger. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, just anecdotally, I'll, I'll say, and I've told my students this, you know, I, I teach both here and in, in, in the undergraduate school. And um, 10 years ago, all of my students wanted to be consultants. They all wanted to go to McKinsey or Bain and... and Five years ago, they all wanted to be investment bankers, uh, and, and that was just, just the thing. Today, they all want to be entrepreneurs. Uh, and, and there is clearly a cultural shift going on, and, and part of it is just rec you know, recognition on the part of various parts of the administration that entrepreneurship needs to be a part of the fabric of American business going forward in a much more significant way than it has been because we, we are the, the nature of value creation and job creation is just changing as we, as we go forward. Uh, and, and one of the things that the program here really is meant to kind of address is how does that, how does that new kind of job creation get embodied in a student experience like the practicum? And Ryan, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your experience in, in preparing to, for the practicum, where you're going to go and, and, and you know, how that's how that's working out for you? Okay, I'm gonna work with bandwidth in the spring. I uh, met with Chris Maton the other day, and it sounds like they have a lot of exciting things going on over there. Um, leading up to that, I spent a lot of time just looking into different companies in the area, trying to figure out you know the law firm experience. Um, you guys actually encouraged us to do something outside of the law firm to kind of get the business sense and the business side of things. So looking at that, and I settled on bandwidth, I met the guys, it was great. Um, but it takes a lot to kind of figure out where you want to go. There's a lot of different versus a startup, the venture capital, but I mean, it just kind of, after researching and meeting with a lot of people, a lot of coffee, a lot of lunches, just kind of settled on one. And I will say that the students in the, in the program have been just incredible at putting themselves out there, seeking out opportunities to network with lots of different members of the community we've you know we we try to facilitate as many of those types of meetings as possible and even if you only end up doing a practicum with one having met several is just a great experience i think for for as a student um you know really just getting to understand the dynamics of sitting down with someone who's a member of this entrepreneurial community and just communicating with them um Glenn, I, I'm, I'm curious from your standpoint. I, I know that you know somewhat about the program, uh, maybe not a whole lot. What, what do you think of this type of academic experience? It, it's, it's fairly new. Uh, there are maybe a couple of other schools in the country doing it. What do you think about it in terms of its fit into the community and, um, and, and how it might uh, become significant? Yeah, I think uh, just since this is my area of law as a person who wants to hire associates, I think it provides... Don't say that. <laughs> well, no, no, no. <laughs> You're going to get mobbed <laughs> right. at, at the end of But, you know, it, it provides these students with a really good competitive advantage when you go into an interview and you can speak, you know, with much more authority on the substance of what I do every day and what you would be expected to do every day. I think all things being equal, you're going to have a serious competitive advantage in those conversations, right? When you hire a new associate at a law firm, I don't know what the statistics are, it might take a year to two years for the firm to be able to recoup its investment in you because there's a lot of training that goes on. Anything you can do to lower that cost, and I think the practical experience you get, what you were describing about going through the life cycle of a venture-backed company, it's just hugely valuable because 
those are things that you graduate from law school from from a traditional program and you learn on the job and you're constantly training and unfortunately sometimes for your clients you're kind of being trained on their nickel and the firm has to write that time off and and that's part of their hiring costs for you um, but if you can come in and hit the ground running that's very valuable I guess the challenge would be and it's still so new I don't know that we figured it out is how do you incorporate this degree into the traditional hiring cycle of a law firm you know that that's a challenge but I think at the end of the day if it's producing the best candidates that will work itself out but yeah that would and, be and just opinion. just a, a, a couple of statistics from last uh, year we had 14 students in the program last year which was the first year and just about half of them uh, went on to law firm jobs the other half went on to a variety of um, different types of business enterprises and undertakings and so there really are a variety of outcomes for the program and, and it's it's meant to be that way it's it, it, the, the the practicum structure is meant to accommodate a fairly wide variety of um, career aspirations and provide the opportunity to, to go in that direction pretty directly so uh, I think as we learn more about how to best position our graduates coming out of here we're, we're going to get smarter about that but you're, you are exactly right it's not not only is it challenging in terms of how you fit it into the traditional hiring um, thing but most law firms are set up to have clerkships in the summer right. and so the practicum actually is a little bit outside of the norm for law firms for, for practicum experiences in law firms just because they're not set up for that time and, and, and so it's a little bit challenging in that sense uh, as well but in general we're very very pleased with the program we're incredibly pleased with the quality of students we're getting the quality of results we're finding with our with our graduates um, we believe that um, along with all of the other efforts of the university uh, this is we're going to be able to contribute very meaningfully to uh, to the the entrepreneurial life at uh, at Duke and then in the community at large and so um, we are extremely pleased with uh, with with where we are right now with uh, the LLM LE program uh, I, I was told to finish up by seven and, and and ask for questions at that point and I'm happy to, to, to entertain anybody, anybody's thoughts, questions, comments. Um, and if not, I'm going to depend on my students to come up with something just so we don't have crickets out here. Uh, go, go ahead. Oh, please, please. I, 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 I would love to talk about that more more than you can imagine but maybe I, 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 <laughs> uh, I would say I, I'm interested what you think also Glenn I, I would say that the, the, the you know there there are a mix of things going on in the entrepreneurship world um, and you know it, it goes from tax policy to uh, availability of, uh, of funds uh, th there is there is an incredible um, uh, sense of kind of nobody knows what's happening going forward and, and, and that is an environment in which in, in, one, in, in one sense you might think it encourages people to take more risks but I think it, it, it encourages the opposite I, I think not knowing how the world is going to look next year as opposed to last year really impinges on people's sense of when when and if they ought to be taking risks with their professional lives and and not knowing what tax policy is going to be in in the next year I, I just think that we've seen over the last few years uh, a, a little bit of a seizing up of the normal flow of ideas and capital and uh, and, and startup activity because of the uncertainty and um, I don't know if you agree Glenn or not or do you, what, what other thought, thoughts do you have yeah, I think at the the institutional level, I think we've seen some slowing down because the uncertainty on a hundred fifty, two hundred fifty million dollar fund is more material. But on the seed stage, the angel investor who's going to write a check for twenty five or fifty thousand dollars to get the company going, it doesn't matter so much to them because frankly they're they're looking at the stock market and all the volatility and the uncertainty, and they said, well, at least I'm going to have fun with this check, right? <laughs> I may lose it either way, but at least this one's going to be a fun ride. So. That's worked out well at the very early stages, I think, 
at the later stages as the companies mature a little bit, it's become a little bit more challenging. Now, the other side of that, interestingly, is that is that for the students, especially the undergraduate students coming and now getting ready to graduate from Duke and, and I'm sure other places, um, the world, they are forced to consider a, a, a much larger number of alternatives because the normal the normal number of jobs available to graduates of, of really any college or, or university is just limited. And so as they start to go through the process of thinking about what am I going to do when I graduate, now maybe starting your own business or starting with a startup or doing other things that are more non-traditional become much more of a reality or a real possibility for, for students in, in the range of options that they perceive as what's, what's real for them. Um, yeah, I, I know, as example, Shoeboxed, they do a lot of hiring out of Duke, and as part of their intake process, they have a whole script prepared to speak to the parents of the students, because they know the parents of Duke undergrads have expected them to go into consulting or investment banking, and That's now interesting. going to work at a startup, it's a competitive advantage for recruiting when they say, here's your job offer, and we'd like to speak with your parents to answer any questions they have about it. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's worked out really well for them. <laughs> um, so, uh, so those would be a few thoughts uh, about that. No, another question up there? Yeah. Um, I was wondering how you define startup versus starting a business, because I'm, I'm starting a business, not necessarily a startup, but I'm seeing a lot in the local community that is sort of locally fed businesses, and we're all helping each other. Mm -hmm. The, the difference between well I you know to me every business that you start is is a startup um, what we tend to focus on here at the law school and somewhat at the business school as well is we tend to focus on the types of startup enterprises that require um, other people's money uh, legal expertise uh, things that that we can teach people more uh, uh, along those lines and, and and you know there are there are entrepreneurial experiences that run the entire gamut of you know starting a software company to starting a coffee shop uh, which you you are doing heroically right now and I'm <laughs> looking forward to to being one of your customers um, uh, but but it's a little you know when we try to bring the students through the educational process, um, you, you tend to teach more toward the end of the things that require uh, more stuff, uh, more more legal expertise, more financing expertise, and and that doesn't mean at all that businesses that are starting up that require maybe less of that but more founders sweat equity and more you know it, it requires as much effort and. Um, and, and uh, commitment to start a business like yours as it does to start, um, you know, a, a, a medical device company. It just it just requires a few other things to start a medical device company. And and we try to uh, define the, the the community as basically anybody who's starting up a company. Um, but we tend to, uh, frankly, teach more toward the ones that need more lawyers. Uh, <laughs> Do you, want to, do you want to say anything to that? Yeah, no, I think it's interesting because you hear the word entrepreneur used a lot, and I think it's taken on this colloquial meaning to be a technology or um, a company built around intellectual property. You know, but it it's obviously has a much broader meaning. But I'm assuming in your program it's really geared towards the high-growth technology, life mm -hmm. science company that's taking in outside institutional capital to grow at a very rapid pace. But there is lots of entrepreneurship in this area, and I think there is a almost a fraternity feeling amongst the startup, the technology startups, and then the people like yourself doing the coffee shops, and a real loyalty to support those businesses. Question, yeah. I'd like to inject a point of difference with respect to something each of you just said. I think that entrepreneurial companies, whether it's a coffee shop or a high tech company, have sophisticated legal needs. Some of them just don't require intellectual property legal sophistication and or securities law sophistication. But I think the legal needs of most startups are quite complex. The problem is most of them know 
don't have the money to afford to pay for those services. Certainly not with the big firms. But I think I don't think I agree with you, uh, and I think you might be making a mistake in your program if you are in fact concentrating only on those that have securities law needs and information technology or, or medical device or biotech where you have sophisticated patent, trademark, and copyright needs. Okay, yeah, I, that, that's a fair point. We, um, unfortunately, we, we, we have to select from among the entire world of possibilities, you know, to focus a little bit uh, on, on one type of, uh, of company, but I, I, I clearly agree with you that, uh, that there are sophisticated needs in, in really any company. Um, do, have you, you've had that experience, right? Yeah, and there's some, but keep in mind, this program is being run by someone with an iPhone in front of him, and he's using <laughs> a CD-ROM as a coaster. <laughs> so that gives you a sense of his background. <laughs> Yeah. A little bit related to that. How about social entrepreneurship? Do you have much else? Well, interestingly, um, social entrepreneurship is as active and ha has, a, has as active and enthusiastic a uh, contingent or following at Duke and, and other places as, as any other type of entrepreneurship. And in fact, last year, uh, one of our students did a practicum at Triangle Community Foundation because uh, he had a very specific interest in, in that career path. Uh, when, when you look at the Duke Startup Challenge and other kind of startup activities on campus, I would say a, 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 a very significant number of the student projects that come forward tend to be socially focused and, and social entrepreneurship. Um, and, and I think some of you guys who are looking at Participating in some of these things have seen that there are Ryan. Have you have you seen that? Uh, well, most of my stuff has been the medical device, the biotech thing. I know there's a lot of are, there are a lot of social things, and I know several of our students are very interested in the social enterprise and things like that. So I think it's that's the good thing about this program is there's enough flexibility built into it that if that's your area of interest, that you're encouraged and allowed to go pursue that. Whereas if somebody is more interested in tech, they can go do that. So I think that's part of the beauty of the flexibility. The, the other interesting thing about social entrepreneurship is there is probably as much academic activity and research in the area of social entrepreneurship as there is in more, more kind of grubby capitalism. And, and I think the reason is that social entre entrepreneurship has uh, some things in common with entrepreneurship uh, more generally defined but the, the nature of the impulse behind it is different. The, 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 the networks required to be successful are a little bit different. Um, the factors for success tend to have some other facets to them. And so there, there's a lot of great academic work being done, a lot of it over at Fuqua, as a matter of fact, one of the world's leading researchers and academics in social entrepreneurship sits over there. And so it's a big part of the community here. There's also um, Bull City Forward over in downtown Durham, which uh, Duke professor startup Chris Gergen, and it's an incubator for social companies with a social entrepreneurship mission. And he's trying to turn Durham into the world's hub of social entrepreneurship. So there's actually a lot of interest in the community in it. And hopefully they'll drink a lot of coffee too while they're... That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, question. Well, I think to start with, what you're going to find is this community is unusually welcoming of new people trying to do things. And I, and I, would, I would guess that 
ninety percent of the people you end up calling with your issue would be more than happy to help you. Now, the way you find out who it is you ought to be calling is, um, I would suggest, and I don't know what exactly your business is, but there's probably someone or, or, or some number of companies in the area that have done something along those lines or some, you know, generally in that genre of thing. Um, and literally, if you just simply find out who those companies are, find out who the CEO is and dial up the phone, um, I, I, would, I would say the odds are huge that someone will take your call, spend some time with you, and if they can't be helpful to you, suggest someone who would. Uh, th there just isn't any substitute for picking up the phone and just making contact. Uh, and, and you will be surprised at how receptive people are f in, in this community. You want to, do you agree? Yeah, I grew up in New York, but I guess it's Southern hospitality. It's a very welcoming community, and anyone you talk to will either help you directly or put you in touch by a, a warm introduction by email or phone with the right person to talk to. You know, there's Hatch over um, at the engineering school that you could register. I'm a coach on call, and there's lawyers, accountants, bankers, who show up once every week, I think it is, and will provide guidance and just informal mentorship, and then those people will help you get in touch with the right people, so definitely there, opportunity. There's also a mentorship program at the Council for Entrepreneurial Development also, isn't there? Mm -hmm. that's I right. think that's a little bit more formalized, but you should get to know the, those people as well. And if anybody, if anybody won't return your call, tell me who they are, and I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll call them. Yes? Is that right? Okay, great, great. Do you know what department? I know a couple of people who are associated with it, but I'm not sure exactly what organization at state it's, it's coming under. Okay. I know they've got kind of an incubator thing going over on the Centennial Campus, and i got a feeling it's, it's out of there, but okay. I'm not sure great. what it is. Or Ashley Hudson is the director of that incubator. If you want to try to send her an email, she may be able to help. Other thoughts or comments? Yeah. If your program becomes everything you want it to be, what does it look like and how, how does it get there? Well, so a couple of things. One is I think it stays fairly small for the foreseeable future. I think it stays in the 20-student range. One of the things that we've, I think, tended to be successful at is really tailoring the experience kind of handcrafting the experience for individual students' needs. And I think growing much larger than that presents some problems of scale that we would have to get a little bit more experience with before we can, can go much farther than that. Um, the other attributes would probably be that it becomes so uh, ingrained in this community that my students end up becoming the buyers rather than sellers in these practicum conversations and people are coming inbound to us and saying we've heard great things about these students and this experience and how can we get one of, you, the, one of the coveted spots in, uh, in, 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 in bringing these practicum students into our, our companies. And then, you know, I think the third thing would be that, that, that the program itself becomes known and respected for producing a set of skills and a set of experiences that create measurably more prepared, name your profession, lawyers, business people, whatever, as they come out, and that the value of the experience gets reflected in the, 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 the level of, uh, of notoriety and, and, and the kind of um, cachet that the program has. And if we can, if we can accomplish those things, I think you know, we've got the ability within, with this community to leverage all of the strengths of Duke and what surrounds it and, uh, and, and make this program really special from, from, from a lot of aspects. Yeah? What percentage of your students in the first class uh, were coming directly from law school and, and did that affect their desire to go to a law firm versus a, um, a startup? I don't know about the second part of the question uh, because I don't, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember. A, a, a few of the students came directly from law school, but only a few. Um, most of them had had some experience doing other things. Some had practiced law. Some had come as you know, basically mid-level associates at, at, at law firms. 
Um, I, I don't. I, I can't say that I have enough data to tell you whether or not the students who come right out of law school tend to want to go to law firms when they finish. Um, I don't know, Bill. Do you do you have any memory of that? Yeah, I do. Uh, it's interesting. I think that people initially uh, uh, there were more people initially who thought that they wanted to go to law firms, but the final analysis who split up and did something that all more alternative. And um, I think that's a function of, of people just initially selecting something that was more comfortable to them, uh, and and also a function of this was what we as the school were more comfortable with initially. And so I think as, as the program progressed, we understood that it was part of our role to facilitate the best and, and, and the highest for the students, rather than bring any sort of predisposition as to what they should and should not do. And so I think we've become I mean, certainly with Kip's help, I would, I would say that I mean, getting some of these students into uh, non-traditional uh, routes has been very successful. And the success that we had last year in getting these guys into practicums outside of law, law firms really helped us uh, cement the success of the program in that respect and, and therefore created that as a more viable route than maybe we had feared or thought we could do. And, and I will say that we're, we're very aware in the program of this experience not being, in essence, the fourth year of law school and not being a 4L experience. I would consider, and I think the students would consider this program very much of a failure if it was simply an extension of what you do as a, as a third year law student. And so I think there's, there's probably some emphasis on making sure that a, a much wider range of possibilities are available to students, whether they want to take advantage of that wider range or go, go to a law firm that represents entrepreneurial clients. That's kind of up to them. We don't, we don't have a dog in that fight, really. We, it's, it's fine with us as long as the students feel like they're truly being served by the range of options that, the, that they have when they leave. Yeah, Ken. Uh, sounds like great service broadening it out to uh, ELL students and getting them to consider non-traditional careers and understanding that it's distinct from JV program. Uh, nevertheless, do you see any of that potentially trickling down to the JV program? That sense of, uh, gee, it might be attractive to consider uh, something other than the law firm? I think that's been happening for, for m many years now. I think, I think the statistics are that something like 30% of students at some random sampling of law, f of law schools end up doing uh, non law firm type. Type jobs is that is that about right, Bill? I mean, it's 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 really you know the value of a law school education has has kind of uh, broadened in, in people's sensibilities already. Um, as as we go forward and get more visible here at this law school, I think that the 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 possibility of doing something entrepreneurial might come more more directly to the forefront. Um, but in general, uh, you know, I think it's I think that's part of a larger trend of people viewing a law school education as a means to a, a wider variety of ends than working at uh, your firm or others. So, yeah. Is there any, is there any thought toward how you can help alums? I mean, not like me, but alums short law firms will want to do something else, find some roots because fourteen people is not. There will come a moment when we need to have that thought. We, I, I think we're just trying to not be stupid about what we're doing right now. But, but you're exactly right. I mean, we, we've got, we are part of a very active community, and the community is getting wider and wider as technology allows us to be neighbors with people in Silicon Valley and Boston and other places. And and, and, and as the number of Duke graduates kind of populates all of those communities. And so, um, you know, uh, uh, eventually as, as, as this evolves, I, I really do think we will be in a position at least to help uh, alumni who have this interest, but maybe not a, a spare year to, to go and devote to this particular program. And we'll try to be as helpful as we can. We, I think it's a little bit more in the future, though. Other questions? I'm, I'm told that there's additional food. There is additional food and drink and lots of fellowships. 
Thank you. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.